haven't read the book, the main character is Professor Lee. He's an aging professor of mathematics at a second-rate Midwestern college. His disappointments professionally are only um, are only one fraction of his disappointments in life. He was married once to a woman he loved and treated poorly. Now she's dead. He has one grown daughter. Now she doesn't speak to him. His neighbors think he's unfriendly, and his colleagues find him prickly. All told, he's uh, a lonely person, and he's made lonelier by his colleague in his mathematics department, a young professor named Hendley, who is wildly popular with students, and who one day, while Lee is sitting in his office next door, um, opens Hendley a letter bomb, which detonates in Hendley's office, and the force throws Lee to the floor in his own office. And his first reaction is of gladness, because he's so terribly jealous of Hendley, and then his next reaction is of shame for having such a horrible first reaction. At the hospital for once, he wasn't bothered with medical forms. It was the only hospital their town had, the same hospital in which Esther, his daughter, had been born, and in which Lee had undergone sundry minor procedures in the course of the decades. Lee arrived in his own ambulance in Hendley's chaotic wake, but once there, he neither saw Hendley nor heard anything about him. After the shocking, ghastly coincidence of having so closely felt the blast that had scorched and torn Hendley's body, and after the intensity of self-examination the blast had occasioned, this separation from Hendley felt imposed and mistaken. Lee felt Hendley's non-existent presence like a phantom limb on the far side of the wall of his hospital room, and he wanted to go to Hendley, to speak to him, even speak for him. By the time the interminable battery of tests and observation periods and medical interrogations had ended and law enforcement personnel were at last set upon him, Lee was bursting with unexpressed sympathy for Hendley, as if he and Hendley were one. He enthusiastically launched on his part of the story and, as a result, overtold it. It was true, he had to admit, that he could not be 100% positive the package containing the bomb had been delivered that day, though he felt it had been. It was true he could not be 100% positive Hendley had been alone in his office that whole afternoon. But he wanted everyone to understand that he overheard Hendley, that the soundtrack of Hendley's daily life underscored Lee's life, too. Hendley's frequent and lengthy and jovial phone calls, his loud visits from students, his bleeping and honking computers. Everything as it always was, day after day, until the thunderous boom. It was terrible, Lee said, his voice unexpectedly breaking. The retelling had made his skin crawl. It must be a mistake. Who would do this to him? Who would do this? Only sick people, animals. Could it have been a mistake? One of the policemen asked keenly. Maybe there's someone else at the school you think might have been the real target for this. This was before FBI had arrived and brusquely shunted the locals onto the sidelines. Who would want to kill us? Lee asked weakly. We're only professors. We don't do anything. Before the interrogation began, Lee had felt a raw force piling up in his gut. Rage at the attempted murder of Henley, belated fear for himself, the pressure of which just increased as the questions wore on. Lee had thought that talking would help, but with the policeman he'd found himself under constant restraint, required to add qualifications to every assertion, so that by the time he was free to go home, he was quaking. Are you sure you're all right, said the doctor who'd come to discharge him. I wonder if we ought to keep you another few hours. I'm all right, Lee practically shouted. I want to go home. Released at last, he floated down the hospital's hallways and through its main doors in surreal anonymity. But once he arrived on the sidewalk, he felt the atmosphere shifting. It was past nine o'clock. He realized he had not eaten dinner. The sidewalk approaching the hospital entrance met the curb in a T, and that T was outlined on both sides by crushed tufts of snake grass and recent tulips already losing their petals so that they looked like gapped teeth. Lee stared at these plants. They glowed a chill, livid white, as if blasted by rays of the moon. Their shadows were too long and so crisp that their edges looked razored. He realized that the tea was congested with people and lights, the harsh, bluish-white lights of news cameras. 
He stopped walking and squinted uncertainly. Professor Lee, he heard someone cry then, in a voice like his daughter's. Lee swiveled his head in confusion. But before he could find her, the crowd surged toward him, stroboscopic with shadow and light. Professor Lee, said a new, sharper voice, can we ask a few questions? You were there when the bomb went off, weren't you? Yes, Lee said, on instinct, pulling off his glasses, as he did when he lectured. Yes, I was, he repeated.